thrilled and honored to welcome to the Women Law and Leadership class our distinguished guest, Sherry Blair. Every year I host a leader to the class who personifies the values of the class. Last year I hosted Martha Minow, the 300th anniversary professor of Harvard University and the former dean of Harvard Law School, along with her good friend, Justice Abela, the justice of the Supreme Court in Canada, who's known as the Ruth Bader Ginsburg of Canada. And together, Cherry Blair, Justice Abela, Martha Minow, make this moment possible for all women. So, Sherry Blair, you have had a front row seat to history during a pivotal time in our contemporary history. And you often talk about it, but I would say that you are not just a witness to history, but a history maker. And we want you to speak about that role that you play in changing history, especially women's history. But to my class of emerging leaders in the law and in business, Teddy Blair, Queen's Counsel, is a leading international lawyer, a voice for women around the world, and the wife of former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. She was the first in her family to go to university. She became Queen's Counsel in 1989, the highest honor bestowed on a barrister, and was the seventh woman Queen's Counsel in the imperial history of the United Kingdom. You, Terry Blair, you're a leader in the law, first and foremost. As the 75th woman to be appointed a Queen's Counsel, and like another close friend of mine, Prime Minister Mary Robinson of Ireland, you have fought some of the most groundbreaking cases on anti-discrimination, including sexual identity. You have appeared in a number of leading cases, including Lisa Grant versus South West Prince before the European Court of Justice on discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. You are also the first lady of the United Kingdom. And your role as first lady defied stereotype. This class is about understanding stereotype, identifying stereotype, and then defying them, breaking them, unpacking them. You have said in your book, which we have read as a class, speaking for myself, that you violated the image of a first lady. And just before you came in, Sherry, we watched the trailer for Hillary. And Hillary said the same thing, that she violated the image of a first lady. In fact, the first official visit that you hosted at Downing Street were the Clinton. And in the brief that you received, you were told to be non-threatening, that to behave in a non-threatening manner. And you write, heaven forbid that I might look like a career The office might think that I've turned into Hillary Clinton. You are Hillary Clinton. You are the Hillary Clinton of the United Kingdom. But then you and your husband redefined gender roles balancing work and family, and what it was to be a working mother and a spouse to the Prime Minister of the UK. Before, before just in the art, your husband was a peer in Downing Street. We speak often about just in the art and being a mother and a Prime Minister. Your husband was a father and a Prime Minister. And he always said, I do the same thing more or less as any bloke does with his kid. So he was a caregiver and a primary caregiver while he was a prime minister. You, on the other hand, have looked at the tension of being a mother and a queen's counsel. You have said, I was so intent as a young lawyer on beating the men at their own game that I didn't take the real maternity leave with my three young children. It is only looking back that I realized I wasn't beating the system, I was reinforcing. A fourth aspect of your leadership, and your very reflective, introspective memoir 
is the ways in which you are focused on the relationship between women's leadership and appearance. I hope you don't mind me. I have underlined the main case in your book, which refer to your focus on appearance and your weight. <laughs> and you see the constant test that you speak of, the role that appearance plays in a leader who is also a person. And the conception, the perspective that people, the public have of the way in which a first lady needs to look at. You were told to protect a softer image, the image of an ordinary mom. And that was a major conundrum. That was the paradox of being one of the leading lawyers in Europe, as well as a prime minister's wife, consort, and a mother. Your afterlife is a whole different stage of your leadership career. After you left Downing Street, you wrote a book. This book that we have read, and you very interestingly call it a woman's book, unabashedly, courageously call it a woman's book, that you wanted to write a woman's book. You wrote a book for women by a woman. And you said, in the last chapter that we have read and examined, I was not prepared to spend the rest of my life worrying about what people thought about the way I dressed. It didn't matter in real terms, and it certainly didn't matter to me. What did matter to me was helping other women find their voice. And that is the reason you're here with us today, Chet, because you want my students, the next generation of leaders, to find their voice. And you, by being with us, are amplifying their voices. You started a foundation on women's leadership in business, and you have said investing in women pays the highest, biggest dividend in the business. And then finally, you talked of something that is so important and interesting to my students who are lawyers, but who are also political analysts. You talk to the two pillars as you test to us, the law and politics. And you say, if I want to make political decisions, I should stand for election. If I want to do something in the legal field, that's different. That is my biggest part of qualification, the law. But politicians are the ones who stand up there and are answerable to the people. So you see the ways in which the incestuous relationship is both complement, but also you found out that one and both are not only complementary but mutually reinforcing because of your career and your husband's and the careers of other women like you, Hillary Clinton. I want you to speak about the importance of transformativity because our class is not only about understanding the role of leaders in the life of the law, but also understanding a new theory of leadership. In fact, the assignment that my students have is to develop a new case on leadership, a new case on inclusive leadership, and to assume that each one is an author writing a new chapter in this new treatise on leadership. And it's part of leadership you have travel the world. And in fact, because we are speaking of leadership against the back of the fall of Afghanistan and the takeover of Taliban, I think your words are especially poignant when in your during your first trip to Afghanistan, the women told you, don't forget the women of Afghanistan. And so many years later, now we are at a point in 2021 that needs to be heard loud and clear across the world, especially in the halls of power. And finally, Sherry, to talk about Nelson Mandela being one of the heroic leaders, the nobility of leadership. And you said when you met him, he defied preconceptions. And I want to say that in the final analysis, you defy preconception. Thank you for being with us, Terry. And I hope 
you can address some of the points that I have raised. And afterward, I want some of my guests who are with us to have a conversation with you. David Hornick joins me. He is faculty at Harvard Law School and at Harvard Business School. He is one of Silicon Valley's biggest venture capital investors. He has seen the role that capital plays in building business and the political economy of our world. David is also the head, the vice chair of GLAD, the nation's largest organization on LGBTQ. And given your own work on anti-discrimination, I thought it would be a great meeting of the mind to connect. And we also have Mega Pare, the first woman of color general counsel in the national football team, in the national football league. He oh, became, imagine how difficult that is. <laughs> yeah. And he became general counsel at the age of 27, the youngest general counsel of the NFL. And her owner is a Pakistani. He is an Indian origin. You see the importance of that kind of geopolitical relationship is there. And her owner also bought one of your own hallowed football team, the soccer team in the UK. So I thought just having three of you together today would be an interesting juxtaposition and an interesting narrative for myself. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to spend the next 10 minutes sharing your story of leadership. And then I would like David and Mega to talk to you. And then I have two student locutors who are excited to connect. Again, welcome, Cherry. I am so proud to be you. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And, and very nice to see um, so many uh, younger women here. Um, and uh, I'm delighted also, of course, to see David here and looking forward to, to, to our conversation. Um, you know, sometimes when, when you're introducing, mean, I'm very glad that you have read my book because I can tell you that none of my own children have. And every now and then I say, don't you want to read my book? And they say, mum, we've read the reviews. It's so embarrassing. There's no desire to learn about your sex life. And I said, but it's really not a lot of things. <laughs> But there we go. Uh, a prophet is never necessarily um, valued in their own home. <laughs> um, it's 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 strange for me to think that um, when they said uh, when I went into Downing Street, there was this idea that somehow I was the odd one out that as a working mother with three school children, that somehow I was not the norm. Um, and of course, the reality was that that is the case for my predecessor, that they were not working women. In fact, none of my predecessors had ever been to university, including the man, Dennis Thatcher. Um, but the reality was, in 1997, we had huge numbers of women in our workforce. The vast majority of whom were in fact working mothers and who daily spent their time balancing the issues of work life and how to be a good mother, uh, a good partner, and of course, a good employee. Most of those women did not have the resources that I was lucky to, enough to have because by that time I was a Queen's Council and uh, was in fact the main wage earner in uh, my family. Um, so actually it was a system uh, that was wrong, uh, not me. Um, and we yet, we still have this position where it's somehow felt that women should see their main role as care providers. We talked about stereotypes and funny enough in this last uh, 18 months or so during lockdown my foundation has been focusing quite a lot on stereotypes and looking at the sort of stereotypes that the women that we work with in lower middle income countries encounter and you will be not amazed i'm sure to find 
that 96% of the women we surveyed said that they had encountered some gender stereotypes in their life. I am intrigued as to who or what the 4% who didn't uh, had encountered. Um, and 63% felt that they, that affected the way they were taken seriously as business owners. And uh, nearly 50% of them said the biggest gender stereotype was that family members and friends in particular told them that their main priority should be to focus on family or children. And this was a much bigger disadvantage as an entrepreneur as it was as age or social class or ethnicity or race or faith or sexual orientation, disability. This idea that over 50% of women we survey that somehow they were letting the side down by not focusing on motherhood, or shall I say, parenthood. Because I've always been very firmly of the view that actually it does take two to make a baby, and actually it takes two uh, to bring that child up, at least. Um, so this question of, of stereotypes, whether it was a stereotype that the Downing Street people imagined, I must give up my work, but I go into, into number 10, or the stereotype that the women entrepreneurs we are talking about today, Discover, is still one of the biggest obstacles to women's progress. The belief about what a woman can and should do, um, there's no reality actually to their potential, their desires, or indeed what is actually best uh, for the progress of the world. And I'm sure most of the young women on this course have actually perhaps not encountered that stereotype as an obstacle yet. Um, and that's because, to be honest, I didn't think it was an obstacle when I went to university, as, as I said, and, you know, I was top girl in my school and I became the top girl in my university, and then I came top of the bar finals. I thought, this is marvelous. Everybody's going to want to employ me. Uh, sadly, that was not the case. And it was then that my eyes were really open to the fact that the assumptions about women um, really act as barriers to our progress. That's not to say, by the way, that women don't overcome those barriers. They do. Um, but I also say that exceptional women will always rise to the top, as will exceptional men. But our world is built on the assumption that the just good enough man will get whatever his ambitions are. But if you're a just good enough woman, you can probably expect to be told you're not quite good enough to go to the next stage. So until those who are good enough but not exceptional have equal chances, we are not achieving equality. And David, I, I know that you're in venture capital. And yesterday, as it happened for my foundation, I was giving a, a speech about philanthropy to, and, and impact investing. And I gave a lot of the statistics about why, as I mentioned in the introduction, investing in women makes sense. Um, and I pointed out that despite all these statistics, which shows you get a better return on capital, women are less reckless. Um, actually, if you look at venture capital and look how much of venture capital goes on women entrepreneurs, but the percentage is not 50%, not a third. It's not even 10%. It's 3%. And by the way, this has gone down to 2%. And at the end of the speech as I was going out, um, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I don't know why you keep going on about women because you know, men have suffered from COVID too and you know, men need opportunities. I said, look, I'm the mother of three boys and one girl. I honestly, you know, I actually like men. I'm married to one and I am, I appreciate that. But the, the reality is that statistic of two or three percent of women getting that venture capital. That is not some kind of freak of nature. It's not some kind of inevitable 
consequence of talent. It is all to do with the way society views what women can and cannot do. And we have to break that down, for sure. And we have to break it down for you, because you now are having opportunities and you will go into the workforce in equal numbers, probably better qualified than the men. But you will still find, sadly, almost immediately, and certainly after five years, that those men are going to have more opportunities than you. And the only way we can change that is we have to change the paradigm in business. And we have to change the assumptions made about who does and who does not do certain kinds of work. And we absolutely have to change the paradigm about parenting, about work-life balance, uh, and, and about the equal responsibilities of both parents to be caregivers uh, and nurturers of the next generation, not to mention, as I should, of course, their parents uh, and the people, other people that people have to care for. We have for too long devalued care and overemphasized a certain kind of maleness um, and you all know, I'm sure, the joke, if only Lehman brothers had been Lehman sisters, maybe they wouldn't have been so reckless. I'm hoping you still remember me. You probably don't even, you're probably only children when Lehman brothers went bust, but I'm sure you must have read about it in this. So there, there's well, just a few thoughts off the top of my head. I'm sure David will uh, ask me some interesting questions. Well, you know, I wanted to point out something kind of fun and interesting for this group, which is there is a new bank that launched uh, yesterday, a new investment bank, and um, started by an amazing woman and a friend of mine uh, named Ann Clark Wolf, who should absolutely speak in this class in the future. And she joked that she was calling her organization Solomon Sisters. <laughs> and she was tired of this paradigm of men who controlled all the financial economy and controlled the the world of finance and that um and that she was going to turn it on its head and that women and people of color were going to this was going to be a bank where representation was brought to bear and um so that that will be an exciting thing to see and obviously you're a hundred percent right there's no justification at all for um for the numbers in venture capital, and um, and we all we white male venture capitalists hear these statistics, and we and we say, oh yes, of course that's absolutely true. But we don't change our behavior one iota. We don't say, well then we should really work hard to fund women. We say, oh I'm sure that's absolutely true, <laughs> and then we find then we find ninety you know, 97 out of 100 male entrepreneurs and say like, oh, well, that was, that's weird. <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine how that happened. So, um, so anyway, it, it, it is, a, I think it is a very challenging and, and broken, broken problem. So um, thank you for your I, think, I, I was, I was going to, I was going to say, David, I think part of the problem, of course, is that those venture capitalists and those people in the big banks and things, they're mostly all men. And mm -hmm. therefore, they just reinforce each other's culture. And one of the things that needs to happen is some of the men, rather than women like me, who are perceived as nagging them the whole time, need to start calling out their own, rather than... Uh, so often, uh, women will say, you know, some stupid remark or something is made in a meeting, and, you know, a woman might well challenge that, because we are much more vocal these days than we used to be. We don't just grin and bear it. Um, and then later on, you know, a man will come up afterwards and say, you are so right about that. But, you know, why did you, mister, speak up in the meeting? Why do you let all the other men just shrug it off as just something that moaning women go on about? You know, actually, it's your responsibility. You have a share in making this world where everyone has uh, equal opportunities. And I think it's, it's all about this sense of male entitlement. Ages ago, by the way, um, I did a talk. I mean, this is back in like 2007. No, no, 2006, I think. 
to a group of young Spanish students who were coming over in Santander Bank asked me to speak to them. And I was talking about women's rights and human rights. And, and at the end, I think because he was only 17 or 18, the young man stood up and said, but you're talking about these women taking my job. <laughs> and you know, he articulates what so many men are thinking still. And that's about entitlement. They see a job and they think, I'm a man, ergo, I'm qualified. And the mm -hmm. sad thing is, women look at a job and think, I'm a woman. And, oh, my goodness, I don't know whether I can tick every box. Therefore, I'm not qualified. Um, Absolutely. And we've been reading another book that was written by Ngozi Okonjo Abiela, another friend of yours, and Julia yes. Gale. Yeah, where, that's a great book on women's yeah. leadership. So, you know, we've read chapters from there where, again, you know, these women who have broken the glass ceiling had enormous skepticism about their own powers. And then we think if these women who are heads of state had so many doubts, then what does it say for the rest? Mm -hmm. So you pointed out two, I think, complementary pillars, the equal rights to gender neutral caregiving. Because that, I think, is one of the root causes that drives uh, women to self-censor themselves in many ways and for men to feel that sense of entitlement that you spoke about. So to add to some of your dire statistics, Sherry, we, as you know, only 2% of venture capital go to women, but less than 0.2% go to women of color. And your work is even more revolutionary because it is about building business ownership in the global south. Absolutely. Uh, these women are facing challenges that go beyond venture capital to societal expectations and non-expectations and the cultural barriers that they face in coming forward as business women. And then to your point again, both David and Sherry, and thank you, David, for that, you know, very uplifting <laughs> case study of the Solomon sisters, is that around the world, less than 6% of venture capital senior leadership is women. So less than 6%. So it needs to be this mutually reinforcing uh, dynamic where the where women need to be at the helm of venture capital and need to understand the ways in which there's a correlation between venture capital and women-led, women-owned, minority-owned businesses. So uh, Cherry, can you speak to some of your work globally on building these businesses where it really matters, because this is about the political economy of the world. I'd, I'd be de delighted uh, to do that. Before I do, when you're talking of good books, I'm not sure whether you've seen a book by another friend of mine, Marianne Seacott, it's called The Authority Gap. Mm -hmm. uh, you might enjoy reading that uh, because uh, she talks about what she sees is the authority gap. In other words, that people do not look at a woman and do not perceive she has authority. And there's a very interesting, there's a number of interesting chapters in, in that, not least because she comes up with practical suggestions as to how we deal with that. Uh, but there's a fascinating chapter where she looks at a female to male uh, transgender person and a male to female transgender person. Hmm. And says, so in a sense, these, these are amazing experiments because the female who became a male, mm. said, after a bit, she suddenly found people saying, oh, you know, I really think that book of yours is, is really good. You know, so much better than the one your sister wrote, you know, mm. 10 years ago. It wasn't his sister. Yeah. It was him. Meanwhile, the male suddenly discovered when he became a woman, Whereas before, when he spoke and went into the room, people listened or didn't talk over him. <laughs> and when he became a woman, lo and behold, they did. Um, so it, it's a very interesting book, and, and, and you should definitely look at that. But turning to your actual question, what Sh Sherry, I, yeah? but before you turn to that, I just thought I'd share with you something that was a, an amazing conversation I had with a friend from the GLAD board a woman named Lana Moore. And Lana was born a man and was a firefighter in the Midwest of this country, a very masculine profession, a very, 
and uh, and transitioned to be a fire captain as a woman and was this well-respected fourth generation fire captain. And what she said to me is exactly what you're describing. She said, you have no idea what male privilege is until you lose it. She yeah. said, I have lived the experience. I can tell you because I am now on the other side of not having male privilege and it's astonishing. So I just wanted you to, I mean, it's just, it is a, it's a very important point you're making there. Absolutely, because it is kind of like a real life experiment because right. nothing else changes about these people. Nothing else changes except their, if you like, their exterior appearance. <laughs> suddenly, uh, you know, suddenly they're well, female above the male. And yet they still got the same brain and the same ideas and, uh, and everything else. And yet they found they were treated differently. Uh, but going to the to, to, to what uh, my foundation does, essentially, um, the aim of my foundation was to use technology because essentially I've never survived in Downing Street with a full time job. I'm still the only spouse of a prime minister with a full time job. Since I have been there, that none of them have had jobs before, but since I've been there, we have had other prime minister spouses, but they've all worked part time. But I, I work full time. Um, and um, I, re I would never have been able to do that, but for the power of technology to enable me essentially to work from home. Clearly not when I was in court, but you know, to do a lot of things based at home. Something of course, which is <laughs> we're all very familiar with now. So I wanted to bring the advantages of technology and use technology to help women in low and middle income countries accelerate the process of change because i felt if they if we just went on the way we had done in the uh, developed world you know it took it's, it's taken a long time to get to where we are and we're not at equality yet you know why should why should uh people in low and middle income countries wait as long we could accelerate the process so we use technology to bring skills training uh, because you know th all these things start at, uh, at home and at school when girls are uh, in many societies girls don't even get fed as much as boys and we've touched uh, briefly on what's happening to the girls in Afghanistan not to mention the women um, so it's about skills training to give uh, skills so that the women have the next important thing the confidence because when you're in a society that tells you all the time, women don't do this, you can't do this, you're not good enough, you need to have that self-confidence to be able to say, yes, I can. Uh, and then also to provide the support, a support of networks, because what we found is that if you can bring women together to share experiences, to share networking, it really makes a big difference and we also have a global mentoring platform where we provide men and women mentors it's very important to us that we involve men in this um uh, to help women entrepreneurs for a year-long relationship achieve a specific task and so for the last uh, 10 years or so we've helped the 200,000 women now in over 100 different countries because we use technology which meant that when the uh, covid struck we were already well suited because we were already using technology we we're already doing remote um training uh to be able to um pivot quite nicely with that and the other thing that we do which is becoming increasingly important is as we built up a database of women's experience is to encourage doing research like the research we were doing just about gender stereotypes which we've just launched and also advocacy because at the end of the day uh, you know, we need to come together uh, and we need to, to speak to power about the need for change. So that's what the, the, the foundation does. Um, we do that in partnership. We don't, uh, there aren't, there aren't offices of the Sri Blair Foundation anywhere except in London. Uh, we partner with local organizations. Uh, we see it as that we work with local organizations, giving them our knowledge about how you can use technology, our knowledge about what skill, how you can 
what skilled training can work in a, a blended remote, a combination of remote and face-to-face -face or in global mentoring, which is obviously all over the internet. Uh, and so we don't need to have offices all over. We partner with uh, people on the ground who already know the situation there. And we can then adapt our programs to suit, suit the needs uh, as we find them. Um, I never cease to be amazed at the imagination, the creativity, and the courage of the women that we work with. Um, you know, we can provide them with tools, but we can't even begin to imagine um, what they do with those tools. And, and they do some amazing things, whether it's uh, someone like Choma from Lagos, who set up the first recycling uh, business, social business in Lagos, uh, and, and now is spreading across uh, Nigeria with that. She's just won a, a big grant from MasterCard and uh, was also given uh, an award by Coca-Cola for an environmentally friendly business. And her business model is quite simple. She gives people um, incentives, whether it's in money or in uh, goods uh, that they save up for by bringing their rubbish to be recycled. And she gives other people jobs in sorting and recycling these programs. So she's now employing 3,000 uh, people, mainly women, across uh, Lagos uh, to operate these recycled pools. And she started that program in, in, in 2017. She's come a huge way uh, to uh, 2021. Or uh, one of the women we work with in Vietnam, who, is the only woman head of um, an app right now. She produces apps, and she's been the she was the first they're the first company in Vietnam to actually get Apple permission to produce Apple apps as well as uh, Google apps. It's quite hard to get Apple apps, um, and she has gone from when she first worked with us having less than fifty employees to having over two hundred and fifty now in three different offices. And she herself has been a mentor and is now one of our local partners finding us other Vietnamese women who benefit uh, from our programs. But I remember going to visit her business and talking to, you know, she has a mainly male workforce and asking them what, you know, how they felt working for a woman. And all of them said it was really different from the previous places when they've been working in a technology company run by men. And the um, the way she, her leadership skills and the way she cared about her employees was not only different, but much more um, inspiring to her workforce. And so to I have two students who are interlocutors today, Abigail and Miriam. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask you to ask your questions together so that Cherry can respond as a whole. Abby first. Um, hi, well, thank you so much for coming to our class. Um, I was interested to kind of get your thoughts on having been in the public eye so much, how the media um, yeah. treats women differently, um, how you work, how you kind of control your own narrative. If your book was maybe a part of that too. Um, and I guess how you would advise other women in those positions. Thank you, Abby. Miriam? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for coming to talk to us today. We're very honored to have you join our class. I was reflecting on your career accomplishments and the foundation you started to empower women to start business. And uh, my question for you is, given that you were the partner of a very important elected official and you still managed to accomplish extraordinary humanitarian, political and personal achievements, um, my question is, what advice do you have for women in similar positions who want to carve out a niche for themselves and establish themselves without only being seen essentially in the shadow of their partner? <laughs> Oh, well, um, on the media, um, I have to say I'm a human rights lawyer, but there are times when my, my belief in human rights and particularly in the, the right to the, uh, and in, I know how important it is to have an independent press, but I also know how often that is abused. And um, it's particularly used 
against women. And we've seen plenty of research about how women are portrayed in the media. You know, um, it's so much easier, isn't it? And it's so much more undermining to talk about a woman in whatever role she is about on the basis of what she looks like, what she's wearing, than it is to actually talk about what she's doing. Because you talk about what she's doing, or to some extent acknowledging that she's entitled to do. Whereas if you ignore what she's doing and talk about what she's wearing, you're basically saying that's all women are there for, decorative items to a service the men. Um, now, I don't want you to get the idea that the press is particularly nice to men uh, because uh, the press tend to like people and then they, uh, they build them up and they, they cast them down. And we see that time and time again. But the way they do it to men is at least based more on their actions than it is on their appearance. Um, and I think we're all accountable for our actions. <laughs> So most of us are not really accountable for our appearance. You know, we get what we're given, and it really should not be um, the main criteria on which you're, you're judged. As for the Miriam, um, you know, sometimes I think to myself, and I think I said this in an interview once with just before Tony became prime minister. I said I I started life as the daughter of someone because my father was quite a famous actor in um, in the UK, and in particular, a famous son of Liverpool where I brought up. And I said, now I seem to be, the, I, I am the wife of someone. Uh, uh, and I probably end up, I said, the mother of someone. And since my, my son has recently, you may have even seen in, in, in started a very successful uh, tech business in relation to apprenticeships. <laughs> I'm clearly a clairvoyant. <laughs> and yet, uh, there are times when I used to think to myself, you know, God, if anyone else was a, someone from my background and ends up, uh, uh, by the way, I became QC in 1995, not 1989, uh, but that makes it even worse because I was still number 75. <laughs> because that's another six years that's added on where there'd only been 75 women. And I can tell you there were about 70 each year men. In that, in that period from the first woman in 1949. So um, there are many times I think everything I've done in most households, my male colleagues, you know, they're big cheese. In my household, I'm afraid um, convincing my husband that I'm an equal big cheese can sometimes be difficult. And I think that's because actually, you know, when you are prime minister, you know, that isn't being an important job, one that I, since I shared his politics, um, absolutely was committed to. And so there were times when, though he did take a, long, uh, a role when he was just a, not in power, in with our three older children. Uh, obviously, once he became prime minister and then when Leo was born in 2000, um, you know, the, I think I tell the story, he would he'd like, he'd like to organize his diary so he could come in two our flat, which is on top of uh, number 10, and see particularly the baby before he went to bed. And normally the switchboard would ring up and say, the prime minister's coming up now at seven o'clock, make sure the baby's ready for its bath and then the prime minister's dinner's ready. Because we didn't have, um, Downing Street does not provide you with the kind of catering facilities. Mm -hmm.